You're listening to the Reason Bound Podcast, where it's not what you believe, but why that matters. Now, here's your host, Ryan Michaels. Welcome to the Reason Bound Podcast. I am Ryan Michaels, and today I am here with Kai McFarland. Kai, it's been a long time since we've gotten to talk. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing just great. I figured it was a good time to record since uh, I've got some downtime. So recently, to catch everyone up, basically the last time we spoke on the podcast was episode two, where we talked about um, the Great Spirit. Whenever I think of the Great Spirit, I always think of that scene in Land Before Time where Littlefoot's mother leads him to the Great Valley. It's kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that, right? More or less. Yeah. Just like a searing brontosaurus shadow that kind of like leads you into like the place you're supposed to go. Okay, yeah, I can go there. How has uh how's that been recently? Any news come in from anything spiritual? <laughs> Actually it's funny that you mentioned that. I've been um I ordered this book. I don't remember who is who wrote it, but it's about gay reincarnation. And I was like, wow, I, that that sounds pretty interesting. So I actually could order it in the Netherlands, which is where I'm living, but I ordered it on Amazon.com and my um sent it to my mom's place and she just received it. So I'm waiting on her to send it back so I can start reading it. So that will be really interesting, I feel. Gay reincar I'm buckling my seatbelt. What what is <laughs> <laughs> what is the premise of gay reincarnation? Well, you know, I feel like a lot of um texts talk about you know, just reincarnation in general, but I don't think there's really a lot of readings on kind of gay reincarnation. Like, it's nice, like, oh, yeah, we were, you know, you reincarnate into another body, but I feel like there's nothing specifically for, like, gay gay people reincarnation. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to read it and see what it's all about. I guess it's it's about, like, people who have, um like, what they feel about it and if they believe it. So, yeah. I wasn't aware that reincarnation was something that you subscribe to. You do subscribe to reincarnation? Well, I don't, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to it, but I, I like reading different things, like different spiritual things, you know? I think right. reincarnation is a spiritual thing. So, like, why not read parts about that? You know? Okay, so you're, you're open to the idea that... Exactly. Okay. You know me, right? I... <laughs> <laughs> Do I ever? But yeah, no, that's just an interest, an interesting qualifier on their gay reincarnation as opposed to just reincarnation. But <laughs> God, well, is that the idea that if you're gay and you die, you come back as like another gay, or can you swap out your sexuality? Or that's what I'm trying to find out, and that's what I'm trying to find out what this book is all about. But that'll be another time when I have read it. Okay. And I could talk yeah, absolutely. Once once you know what the argument is, you come let me know what's going to happen when you and I pass on and who we're coming back as. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about it in terms of uh, the spirit. Yeah. Today I thought it would be a good chance to talk to you because it's been a while. And I had recently, I was either reading or talking with someone not too long ago about the topic of should felons who've you know served their sentence and paid their dues to society be allowed to vote? Now, you probably know there's laws that state that felons can't own firearms. So, yeah. starting off with the firearm question, do you think that a felon who's served their sentence should be allowed to own a firearm? That's a pretty big question, and there's, like, different parts of the answer. Like, it depends on maybe how long they committed that crime or what that crime was about. You know, there's people that are felons that have did drugs, you know what I mean? So it depends on, like, what severity of sentence of what had happened. So, yeah, it depends on that. Right, yeah. Do you not agree? You know, I don't really know. I'm kind of mixed on it, if a felon should be able to own a gun. I, I In general, I'm a big fan of once you've paid your debt to society, you've paid your debt to society. And if you're not a safe person to let back out in society, then you shouldn't be let out. But if you've served your sentence and we're going to let you back out. I don't really like the idea that someone would not have all of their rights fully restored once they've paid their debt. So I, I don't really know on the gun question. I do know on the question, more mm -hmm. the point of what I was going to 
talk to you about. Should felons be allowed to vote? And your feeling on that is, I think, the same as mine, correct? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we're thinking that they sh- should be allowed to vote. Right? Yeah, that's what I think. Come on now. It's a constitutional right. And once your rights are restored, regardless of that, if you paid your, like you said, you paid your dues, you are reinstated, you are allowed to vote. So then why shouldn't you be allowed to have a gun, which is also a constitutional right? That's true. That is very true. But I feel like you said you already weren't an example. You you did, you made bad choices. And if, I'm not sure, like, like I said, there's different, there's a different severity, different levels of kind of, mm, I don't know if this person should get a gun because they did this. Like, if you murdered a person, like, pro- probably not. But if you, like, had drugs, you, you, sell, you sold drugs, like, maybe. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're saying that it should, it should more or less have to do with that the person used the gun while they committed the felony? Yes. Okay. Or a weapon that hurt another person, like a knife. Like, say, if they use a knife. No, they don't need another weapon that can harm, for example. Why don't we make sure that they have no access to knives? Why wouldn't we make that a condition of their parole, that wherever they're living, that they're not allowed to have any knives? But really, is that even possible? Because you have to have a knife to eat your food, something like to cut, like, what type of knife. Even a butter knife can kill someone. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of, that's not even possible. So could a chair. I mean, you could beat someone to death with it. That's why I don't know that I'm on board with you shouldn't be able to have a gun. Yeah. These are questions I'm not totally sure about myself. So I agree with you, first of all, that I think that felons should be able to have um, voting rights once they've served their sentence. But people who are against that will say, Well, a convicted felon has already shown that their judgment is severely lacking. You know, they've got very poor judgment, so therefore they should not be trusted with the right to vote. The problem that I have with this argument, well, first of all, how do you feel about that line of argumentation? I think if people feel that way, it's, that's just, they fear, and fear creates irrational thinking sometimes. And... I just feel that people need to realize that they are still a a person and they are still under the constitution and people, and there are some people that go to jail that are falsely convicted. Not, not all of them, but they're falsely convicted. What about those people? What about those people that, that was wrongly accused and then they find out 10 years later or five years later that they did not commit the crime and then they're, you know? Yeah, exonerated by DNA evidence later on or yeah. something. Yeah. L- let's yeah. say there's someone who we know did it. They confess to doing it. They're a felon. They've served 10 years and they come out. Okay. And some people say, well, this person showed that they have really poor judgment. We don't want to trust them with a vote. Okay. Back then they served their, they served their 10 years and then they, they are released. Okay. But then again, it goes back to the severity of the crime. So you need to take, each person individually to figure out whether they are sound of mind and if they are more likely to commit another crime with a weapon. Just on the topic of voting, only on voting, not with having a gun. Okay. Okay. If someone has served 10 years and they come out and someone says, no, this person showed that they had really poor judgment. They committed a felony. They were shown to be guilty. They pleaded guilty. Um, there's no doubt they did it. Now they're out. I don't want them to be able to vote. That just makes a second class citizen. The problem that I have with that argument that, that I often hear people say is that that is insinuating that there is a good or a bad choice. And now, obviously, you and I personally think that there's a good and bad choice, especially if we go back to the last election you know, with Hillary and Trump. (laughs) You and I might not have liked either, but there was certainly a good and a bad choice between the two, um, comparatively. Mm -hmm. So if if someone's going to say, well, we don't want to trust felons voting because they've already shown poor judgment, you might be someone who thinks that even if you haven't committed a crime, if you vote for Hillary, that's poor judgment. Or even if you haven't committed a crime, if you vote for Trump, that's poor judgment. So that argument to me doesn't particularly hold water. I mean, they're going to have to vote for someone on the ballot, and they're not the ones who are deciding who goes on the ballot in and of themselves, you know? Yeah, you're exactly right. Like you were saying, Hillary 
or like Trump, you know, honestly, those Trump supporters are, you know, that's voted for Trump. I'm not saying I'm a Hillary fan or a Trump fan. I'm just saying that if you see what he's Trump is doing, he they, he's not sound of mind. So right. that was a bad decision. So should those people that voted for him rights be taken away because that was a poor decision? I'm thinking that's what you're trying to say, right? Well, I'm saying that it doesn't make, to you and me, whether or not someone has committed a crime doesn't mm-hmm. make a difference when we view someone voting for Trump as being a poor judgment call, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's say we go back to the last election. I say, well, you're a felon and um, you've demonstrated poor judgment. Therefore, in this election between Hillary and Trump, I'm worried that you're going to exercise poor judgment again because... I don't know who they're going to vote for. Maybe they'd vote for Hillary. Maybe they'd vote for Trump. Exercising poor judgment, in my mind, is only them voting for Trump. But there is no one person that gets to decide the vote for Hillary or the vote for Trump is the vote for poor judgment. We all have to kind of decide that for ourselves. So as long as they're not the ones who are solely choosing who goes on the ballot in the first place, if we were picking a convicted felon at random to just choose someone to put on the ballot, like they're going to choose, you know, Gary Busey, for example, then I can see where it's like, well, now we might have a problem. (laughs) It's not like you'd have to search far to find someone who's not a convicted felon who would want Gary Busey on the ballot either. It just seems like a weird argumentation because it'll say that restricting felons from voting, that, that, you know, there's other uh, limitations that we have, such as age, you know, but we have age as a reason. Someone who's six years old is just not going to be informed enough to, <laughs> to make a good decision. You know, residency, okay. if you don't live in the country where the election's taking place, and what are your ulterior motives for wanting to vote? And some, some, sometimes people would argue it's, you know, whether it's politically or racially motivated, given if there's a certain group in society who tends to vote one way and they get targeted more for crimes, mm-hmm. um, saying that they're not allowed to vote. You want to speak to that at all or? So, yeah, so the majority actually of African Americans are, that's the majority that's, you know, imprisoned, like per capita, as in like, you know, the percentage. So you have one population that's imprisoned more than another. And then, oh, yeah, they shouldn't be able to vote. So it, it affects like one, a culture, a whole, a whole race as well. So in black people in general, like mm-hmm. looking at the numbers that yeah. when it comes to voting, vote for who? Democrats. Right. So it do, that is a bit concerning too, because as you said, per capita, there tends to be more blacks in prison as opposed to other races per capita. It's also this group that votes for Democrats more so. So that's another reason why I get suspicious when people start saying, oh no, if you're a convicted felon, you shouldn't be able to vote because you've shown bad judgment. Because that's mm-hmm. likely oftentimes coming from someone who would who would argue that um, the bad judgment is to vote for the Democrat. Look at the numbers per capita of blacks who are in prison. Once they get out, we know who they're going to vote for. So we're going to kind of craft this bizarre argument about how well you're a felon um, you've shown bad judgment, therefore you'll exercise bad judgment in the election. Well, it's not your call to say that there even is a bad judgment. I mean, what if someone thinks that they're, that they're both good judgments or maybe there's a, they're both decent people to vote for? Yeah. I'm, I'm not buying the argument, but then that, that leads into the gun question. Should someone who served their time and who has been deemed safe enough to come back out into society, should they really not be able to own a firearm anymore? Personally, I don't, I, I wouldn't own a firearm, you know, so. Well, I don't you know. live in the kingdom of the Netherlands. Well, true, but even if I was back home, I'd be like, oh, why don't I just today just pick up a firearm, you know, just for my safety. It just makes me feel so safe. Like, it scares the hell out of me. Like, come on now. I'm in Japan, so I definitely, if there's one person who doesn't need a gun aside from you, it's me. I mean, this is a very safe country when it comes to that. But if I went back to the States, I'd probably have to get a gun. These days, <laughs> yeah, like, for real. These days, but like it's at the end of the day, it's just like it's sad. Why I live in a country? Okay, so I was actually living in London like twelve years ago, and having like guns, you know, like handguns, they were against like only the like certain police officers could carry them back then. And if you were caught with a, a gun, you could be 
I, I'm guessing you could be like heavily fined and thrown in jail. So I think that society is very close to American society since, you know, obviously the history and stuff. Mm-hmm. So you have these people living, not living in harmony, but, you know, have, having like restrictions on gun usage or people or just normal people having guns. And then you have Americans that you have guns, but yet if everybody has a gun, everybody's scared of each other and they can shoot each other. Of course you're going to be in fear because of the other person having a gun. Now, if you know what I'm trying to say, if you're in fear, what if you're, what if you're a criminal who wants to commit a crime? Wouldn't that mean that you're more in fear that you're not going to be able to commit a crime and get away with it? Cause someone, some rightful gun owner might blow your brains out if you try. That's true. And yeah, you're right. So for saying that they can't have, um, felons can't have guns is just saying that they can't protect themselves. It yeah. is. Yeah, it's clearly saying that. It's basically saying that. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, there can be felons for all kinds of reasons. There can be exactly. felons for bizarre reasons. And like you said, you can kill someone with anything. And a lot of gun proponents will say that. They'll say that, well, you know, you can, that's why that they'll argue against any kind of gun laws. They'll say, well, you can kill someone with a butter knife or a baseball bat or, okay, well, then if someone's paid their, their dues to society, should they or should they not be allowed to be a gun owner? So, yeah. yeah, I'm a big fan of when someone has paid their dues and has been determined safe enough to, if someone is not safe enough to own a gun, I'm really nervous about them being let back out into American society. Exactly. And the felon can get his hands on, I'm sure, hot guns, you know, guns that are basically, you know, the serial number is like rubbed off. So... I am sure he, they do have access to guns, just like, you know, teenagers have access to alcohol, if you really think, in America. You know what I mean? You can get right. your hands on it, because your parents are going to have it. There's key, people can, like, break in. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I agree. Okay, so basically, when it comes to this issue, we both think that felons should be able to vote. I'm still a little shaky on the gun question. Are you more solid one way or the other? I'm more solid. I'm more solid that felons should have guns. Like you said, if they were let out in society and they paid their dues, but yet they can't own like a gun. But like I said, I, I did say that there is, so the severity of the crime should be taken into consideration. Whether or not they get all of their rights replenished. A court, yeah. For like a gun. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. How about, um, on that topic, how about, uh, transitioning into prostitution. Do you think that should be legal or not? It's legal here, so it's just regulated in the Netherlands. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's more or less. It's not a particularly big problem here either. I mean, there's there's funny little workarounds, but no, I just think that prostitution is like the oldest profession. You know, I'm sorry, and some people. <laughs> I, He's sorry, everyone. I, I'm sorry, but like. He's I'm, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but people I mean the way society is going with like the cost of living the cost of life and then they expect you to work for like morsels of nothing it it looks really attractive let me get you know there's tons you know there's tons of people that do prostitution to pay their bills to get through school and you know I'm not one to judge so and it's legal in the Netherlands. It's regulated. They even get benefits, okay? So people claim that um, you know, people who don't think the prostitution should be legal, they'll say, Oh, you know, that's going to increase AIDS or HPV or some you know, some kind of STI, sexually transmitted infection. Um yeah. some even more alarmist claims is that it's going to, you know, it'll be a skyrocketing of uh, human trafficking and rape and even homicide and stuff like that. The argument that I don't care for the most when it comes to issues about prostitution or anything else is when opponents will say that it, well, you know, it's just immoral. Okay. It's just immoral. That's nice. What are you going to do about that, Kai? It's immoral. So basically everything socially constructed, as you know, Ryan, that's like the go-to for sociologists. I mean, in a different society, you could be like, oh, another thing could be immoral. What we do is immoral. So it depends on where you're, you're at, where you're from. So I don't really think that holds up any at all. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Immoral according to who? Yeah, exactly. Like, who are you to to say it's immoral, which I'm sure you've had immoral thoughts or what you would think would be immoral thoughts. So don't talk to me. I'll give you the hand. I've certainly never had an immoral thought. Mine are all rainbows and bunnies and angels playing oh, harps. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It's really good for you. Good for you. The worst my thoughts have gotten is PG at, at worst. <laughs> yeah, okay, Ryan. Tell <laughs> yourself that. You know, there's um, there's kind of this, and I don't know if famous is the right word, but there's a common question that's asked in, like, I had it in my psychology classes before I switched to sociology, which you sure meet some interesting people in that department. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was doing psychology, and one of the questions, or one of the scenarios we were presented with and then asked um, at the end is this moral or immoral, mm -hmm. is that there is a brother and sister who are adults. Okay, so they're adults or a brother and a sister. They decide they're going to go spend the night in some cabin home. Okay, so they go to some cabin home. They decide that they want to try having sex with each other. All right, and they right. use protection, so there's absolutely zero chance that there's going to be a pregnancy as a result of this. Just in this hypothetical, yeah. it's not going to happen. There's not going to be a pregnancy. And so they have sex with each other. They decide, oh, well, you know, it's, we did it. It's not really for us. And they decide that, you know, there's just for whatever reason, they're not going to continue. And it was just a one-time thing. And then they go about their lives. So then after we're hit with this scenario of this adult brother and sister have deciding to have sex with each other and no possibility of children are going to result from this, the class is asked, how many of you find this moral? How many of you find this immoral? And I'm always surprised, even back then, I was surprised how many people raised their hand and said it was immoral. And it basically goes into the ick factor, you know, how people, when something personally revolts them, they judge that as being immoral. And not, there's very few things that turn my stomach more than the thought of having sex with a family member. But to consenting adults, I mean, how? what are the grounds exactly for saying that that's immoral? Not to say that it's moral either. I mean, it's just, it's. I, I think what we talk about is how scenarios like that, how it's okay to say that this scenario is amoral. Like, it's not necessarily quote-unquote good or quote-unquote bad just like two people having sex like if i you know if uh yeah. john and jill meet at some club and they decide to go home and they decide to have sex with each other that's like an amoral act you can't really point to that and say oh that was a moral thing to do or that was an immoral thing to do it's just you know it happens but they use the example of the brother and the sister to get people to realize how their own ick factor really influences what they're considering to be moral and immoral but yeah but is it their is it bit, like, like I said, it's their culture. So you have to, you know, we were taking in consideration the culture because it's a norm of society to not sleep with their family members. Of course, it's going to be immoral. I could have pulled you that one. Most of the class would raise their hand. But if you are more of a critical thinker, the brother and the sister sleeping with each other, it's like, okay, it's only immoral because we're, we were taught that and it's the norm. But what if, you know, we lived in a culture where, oh, it's okay, no worries, then it would be um, moral. It's based off the society at the time. A lot of what influences our ideas on topics like mm -hmm. this has to do with the society we were brought up in. But let's say regardless of the society we're brought up in, yeah. let's say we're just brought up in a society where this where the, uh, the whole idea of having sex with family members who are at an age of consent, where it's never entered either of our minds. Okay. How are you going to interpret this information, do you think? What conclusion are you going to come to? I, I can't because it's so engraved in our who we are. The norm is so engraved about who we are. Even probably <laughs> saying it or saying something different going against the norm is like kind of like a, oh my God. You know what I mean? So you and I grew up in a society where this would be considered really repulsive by a lot of people, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and a lot of people conflate something being personally revolting or repulsive to them with therefore it being immoral. And you and I are both, I think, coming out on this as saying, well, yeah, that's an amoral act, what they did. They're two consenting adults. There was yeah, no chance yeah. there was going to be a baby born with like sickle cell anemia or, you know, whatever may happen if two recessive alleles are. So we've come to this conclusion. So if someone asks you to justify, how can you say that this is not an immoral thing? What would you say to them? I would just, like I said, point out the society factor. And I was like, like, regardless of like 
where they came from if they were, you know, they were two, like two consenting adults. There's no form of, you know, there's no way for them to create an offspring. Then, okay, whatever. Like, I don't think I could change that person's mind. And just so we're clear, when you think of morality, yeah. what does that mean? If I say morality, what does morality mean to you? What is acceptable socially? That's what morality is. Morality of so then yeah. morality is dependent upon the society in which so then it's let's say Saudi Arabia. The moral thing to do is to execute gay people. Yeah. But is that objectively moral? Is is morality dependent upon the society in which you find yourself? Yeah. I don't Absolutely. think so. Well no no no. I mean as in the fact that you would think that way. Yeah, the, you, you um, might think yeah. that way, but but regardless of what... No, 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 no. Regardless of that, no, no, no. Morally, people should let human beings be who they are because morally, you should be able to live a life and not dependent on the society of the norm. What if someone says the way that you're living your life is immoral and it's harming society? Where is it harming society? Am I exactly. like coming in your bedroom and, and like screwing your... Your husband? I'm um, exactly. no. Exactly, like, exactly. And the only way they can go with that is they could say, well, because there's eternal consequences. And to that, I'd say, oh, really? What are those eternal consequences? Can you demonstrate those consequences exist? And why would a God create people gay if there's going to be eternal consequences? Just uh, mm-hmm. hitting the ball back into their court type of thing. Um, when it comes to religion in the kingdom of the Netherlands. I keep calling it the kingdom of the Netherlands, which sounds funny to me. It's actually the kingdom of the Netherlands, like actually like the, all of it. Yeah. Like the old, old people would, would be like the kingdom of the Netherlands. Yeah. So it's a, it it was, it is a king. There is a king here, you know, right? Yeah. 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 It just sounds weird to me that I keep saying it, but is that how you refer to where you live? People call this place Holland, but but it, yeah, the kingdom of the Netherlands. Yeah, there's a king here, so it would be a kingdom of the Netherlands. <laughs> okay. So the, yeah. in the kingdom, <laughs> in the kingdom of the Netherlands, how important is religion to people in general? Most people don't give two hoots or hollers about it. Like, yeah, they don't care. Like my boyfriend, like he doesn't believe in anything. Is he a, is he like a social Christian? I was talking to someone on another podcast who's from Norway and she, in a weird way, like she doesn't believe in God, but she talks about how she's a Christian socially, meaning that she'll go to Christian events and blah, 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 even though her and the rest of her family don't have any belief. That's, in- I, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I was talking with him and he was like, yeah, I don't really believe in anything. I'm like, okay. As I was saying to him, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm spiritual, right? And he's like, yeah, I know you're spiritual. I was like, okay, but it still, it still works. But it's not like you ever sit him down and you're like, hey, listen to me. You and no. I need to start channeling Sylvia Brown right now before we go on <laughs> vacation. Yes, I'm like, I hold hands and I look into his eyes like, come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No, I never project myself on others. I, I, if they are interested, then I will talk. If they aren't, then what? I won't push. And I, that's how it should be with anybody. You and I recorded kind of about the spiritual stuff, psychics and mediums episode. We did that, I think, back in February. So it's been quite a few months now. Did you ever listen to that all the way back? Um, I, to honestly, like, I don't want to hear my voice back again. <laughs> a lot of people say that. A lot of people say that to me, which is hilarious. A lot of people say they're, they're scared to hear their own voice. I've, I have a long history of hearing my voice played back. So I have some idea of how I sound, but, um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, when is enough? When is enough? Well, cause I was going to ask if you, if you'd given any more thought to anything that we talked about or if it provoked any <laughs> ideas in you or anything else that you wanted to bring up. But I guess if you haven't even heard it, <laughs> I could lie to you, but I, 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 I can't, I can't lie to you. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so let's see. The only other thing of note that's been going on in the news is, of course, um, you know, Trump's been coming up a lot lately. Uh, Flip my wrists, please. Oh, no, Kai. Stick around with us. <laughs> At least for a while. 
Okay. Trump, <sighs> what is there to say? He basically came out on Twitter talking about mm-hmm. how he had talked to military generals or whatever, and that transgenders were not going to be able to serve in any capacity in the armed forces. I didn't know that that's how presidents are issuing directives now through Twitter. Have you ever known anyone that was transgendered personally, by the way? I know, yeah, I know someone, but I they kind of transitioned after I really hung out with them. Like, I didn't hang out with them a lot. They were just an acquaintance, but I see, like, on Facebook how it, they're, like, they're transgender now. So, And then also, actually, there's this uh, girl that was in high school that she's transgendered as well. Um, but I don't, I'm not really, really in talks with them. So I just know of that person. Yeah, but not, not specifically. Let me think. God, yeah, I couldn't think of it. No. I mean, I've, I've known one guy through class and, um, you know, it was just something that I didn't get for a long time. And after I got to know this guy in my college course and he kind of gave a speech, it was in a cell biology class. And so it was relevant and it came up and he seemed like just, and I, I, that was when I realized it wasn't him that was weird. It was weird what he had to deal with, you know, but he dealt with it and just, it, it made a lot of sense. And he was, as far as I'm concerned, pretty much the most normal person in that whole class. But that's, uh, I'm not going to trash the school or anything, but anyway, <laughs> he was, a, yeah, he was a great guy. I ended up sitting by him the whole, uh, the whole term pretty much. And, um, it just seems weird. And in, in, I don't know if you've read very much about Trump's directive on this, but they're talking about, oh, you know, the cost of the therapy. And although, you know, they spend so much money on stuff like Viagra that it seems like it would be a drop in the bucket. But regardless, it's not like someone is going to, while they're in the middle of hormone therapy, be deployed either. Like we've had a Navy SEAL who was transgendered. You know, it's not the first time that someone who's been transgendered would have served in the military. And I guess that uh, military leaders were telling soldiers, hey, like, don't worry. This isn't going to be something that's going to affect you negatively. Yeah, yeah. He said there was a, uh, after Trump threw out his tweets, there was a general named Joseph Dunford. And he basically issued uh, a statement or guidance to military commanders, and he just made it really, really clear that as far as military policy towards transgender uh, soldiers go, there's not going to be any change whatsoever up until the time where the defense secretary under Trump, who's Jim Mattis, he would have to first receive further direction from the White House. So it seems like a weird thing for Trump just to hop on Twitter and like spew out all these directives because um, what the president tweets does not suddenly become new policy. What what did you think when you heard this? Did you have any thoughts in particular? Well, um, my boyfriend had mentioned something about what you're saying about it, you know, them spending so much on Viagra, but it would cost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, I just feel like a president that needs to use Twitter as a place of communication is really sick. But what I'm what I'm very worried about is just the mentality of of the present, like the disposition he is in mentally, I'm in the mental state. Well, That's I've been kind of, worried about that since day one. It's just getting worse. It's like a flip and roll coaster. Yeah. And it's just going downhill real fast. And also I think his his um daughter, Ivanka, Ivanka, is that his daughter? Yeah, Ivanka, yeah. Ivanka, I guess she had text something about, oh, we are very, you know, thank you LGBTQ, you know, thank you for, you know, whatever. And she was kind of acknowledging, bring honor to them. And, and then all of a sudden it was like, you know, your dad is spewing this hate. It's very contradicting. It's very weird. I mean, I don't understand where this came from. I assume that it might be to distract from the ongoing Russia investigation, which if I was Trump, I'd be highly motivated to distract from. 
Um, <laughs> ABC News yeah. was reporting that estimates of the number of transgender troops in the service vary widely. A Rancorp study said roughly 2,500 transgender personnel may be serving in the active duty military and 1,500 in the reserves. And it estimated only 30 to 130 active duty troops out of a force of 1.3 million would seek transition related health care each year, which would mean costs could be anywhere from 2.4 million to 8.4 million is what their estimate was. And ABC in that article went on to say that um, the study by Ramcorp found that 18 other countries allow transgender people to serve openly in the military and quote, in no case was there any evidence of an effect on the operational effectiveness, operational readiness, or cohesion of the force, Rand said. So, and that was uh, the name of the article is Military Scrambles for Transgender Policy After Trump Tweets by the Associated Press. I don't know. I don't get it. Um, he's he's a character. I think uh, I, I still can't believe he's president some days. I mean, Hillary was not a perfect candidate, but just to think that we have President Trump, it's kind of mind blowing. But I just wonder who our next president will be. <laughs> some celebrity. <laughs> some celebrity. Yeah. Can you imagine? Like I was reading, I, I I don't even know when I'm reading the news if it's real or not anymore. But I was reading something about um, the Rock possibly starting oh, yeah, an yeah. investigative committee to see if I mean would you vote for the rock if he ran for president um i i wouldn't say I, it depends on who he, he was against i'm sorry you know what i mean if okay. he was against somebody else that was really ridiculous then maybe isn't that so sad though that we'd have to hesitate to say it depends on who he's against because that's true yeah, but ju- I mean, it should be a, it should be kind of like a joke to even suggest that The Rock would run for president. But then it's like, well, it depends who he's against. And th- these days and times, he might be against Trump. Exactly. So if he's a Democrat, then hell, he, yeah. Do you know? Have you heard of? I think her name is Maxine Walters. She's yes. very. She's a black lady. Oh my God. She just isn't she the head of the Congressional Black Caucus? I believe so. I yeah. believe she's yeah, she's a representative and. It's so interesting. It's like she's very in your face. Yeah. She's very in your face. So people are trying to like, oh, we want you to run for president. So I wonder how that will pan out. Because she's gaining a lot of momentum in that aspect. Like people are like, oh, wow. I don't know if she would be such a good choice. Do you think that she would be a good choice? I don't know, but you need anything better than Trump right now. And I don't know if she, like I don't really know her, but I just I just know that she's she's a very determined lady. So, you know, the only thing I'm worried about in the next election cycle is that the people on our team, progressives and Democrats and liberals, or at least people who are in our team in uh, mm-hmm. label only, if nothing else, they're not going to win an election based on America as this highly flawed country and everything's problematic and everything's racist and everything's homophobic and we need to totally revamp. I mean, if they would run instead on like America's a really great country, we have room for improvement. Let's take a close look at the principles that we're supposed to be living our lives on, promoting everyone's livelihood on and really push those. And when there's a problem, we identify and fix it. Because it seems like the message coming from the Democrats is let's just get all these people who feel they're disenfranchised together and create this all new coalition, unlike anything we've ever seen and run on a message of America sucks. And I don't think that's going to win very many independents over to them for them. It's an, it's not negative. No, that's a negative message. Let me ask you something as someone who has now lived outside of the United States as I am. When it comes to the racial issue, as you, as now you live in the kingdom of the Netherlands, when you look back at America now, how do you, how do you feel in general? Like, do you feel that America is a quote unquote racist country? Do you feel it's an imperfect country that sometimes has racial problems that we need to fix and address? How, from your perspective? I think America most of America is so flippin' ignorant. Ignorance is running rampant. I love parts of America, but the majority of America have the biggest idiots. And I, it's just shocking. It's just like, for me, like, being of, you know, I, I'm a mixture of a lot of things. People look at me and they're like, oh, you're black. Yeah, I, I do have that part of me, but, you know, my great-grandpa was white, so, like, I have a mixture of everything in me. It's interesting. Here, 
it's very, you know, they love different. They love variety. They love, they don't look at you like, for you being black. They aren't, they aren't, they aren't oh, you're African American, blah, blah, blah. No, it's like they take you out at value. And even like, you know, and even the guys here, they're like, they're like, oh, wow, you're, you know, you come from the States and blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's quite interesting. Like I would, but the question is, would I actually like end up, you know, like change it? Would I change my citizenship here? Or is that? Sure. Would you change? I was just, I was just curious now that you've lived outside of America, how you view it, because kind of what I was talking about, I don't see how progressives and Democrats are going to win the next election saying basically most of you suck the basket of deplorables that probably okay. shouldn't have been said. And you kind of took the same line that most of Americans are pretty ignorant. And I'm thinking, well, I don't. It's true, but. I'm outside of America looking out at a different perspective. So, like, they are ignorant to the rest of the world. And it's sad, but yeah. it's true. And, you know, I've just been told, like, you know, is how is ignorance so big there? And I just don't know myself. I'm just like, I just, I'm shocked. It's just shocking. Maybe part of the reason that Americans... So, when you say Americans are ignorant, I was going to ask you in what way? Like, what way? They aren't are... educated. Yeah, and, sure. But in what in what areas? They don't critically think. That's huge. They don't question. If somebody thinks like, oh, like Trump was like, oh, America's great. Oh, yeah, America's great again. Let's make America great. And they Okay, why? Is, oh, so you're saying America wasn't great? You know what I mean? Yeah. Why did he say that? They, don't, they wouldn't say a question like that. Now, given most people voted for Hillary in the last election, even though Trump won yeah. the Electoral College, yeah. do you still believe it's most, the, the majority of Americans? That are like this. I just feel like it, that, that electoral college is outdated. So I think our voting needs to be restructured. But given that most people voted for Hillary, do you, st- do you st- still maintain that you think it's the majority of everyone in the country that is ignorant? I think whatever. Okay, so when you just say that, I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of backed me against the wall, Ryan. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, for you saying that, mm. well, it's still ignorance. If Trump won, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's still ignorant. Like as many votes as he had, there's still a lot of people. The people that have power in America, they're ignorant people. Let me ask you this, um, yeah. because I agree with you that there is a a certain percentage of Americans that are ignorant. But I tend to find that this that. A lot of the people who are ignorant are on our side, the progressives. And I mean, I can't tell you how really? many friends. I, yeah, I can't oh, wow. tell you how many friends I have on social media and so forth that were so Bernie or bust. And Hillary and Trump's the same. And Hillary's a criminal. And I'd say, how is she a criminal? And they'd say, because she just is. And just, just, and they would not vote. And if you look at ballots, like I think they were talking about throughout the Rust Belt, like there, people still voted. They'd vote for everything on the ballot except for the very top one, which is who did you want for president? They maybe they couldn't bring themselves to vote for Trump, but they couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary, who was someone that they felt did not understand them either. For all the Bernie or Busters and the super progressives and the super liberals that, that decided to do, to write in Mickey Mouse as a protest vote, I can't help but think that those people are just as ignorant as yeah, the people on the yeah. other side. Uh, yeah, that is ignorance right there, too. <laughs> Honestly, if Hillary was anything like Bill, it was, it was okay. So, it was okay. The 90s weren't horrible years, no, yeah. I mean, despite Bill's personal shortcomings, which... Exactly. It would have been wonderful, regardless of, you know, it was wonderful. It was great. I remember the 90s being a good time. That was, yeah, we were kids during the 90s. That was the last time I remember feeling that, like, oh, everything's great. Pretty good. Uh, but now, ever since after Bill Clinton, that's when everything started going downhill. Yeah. Not everything. And the Obamas were great. I think the Obamas are right. So yeah, the Obamas were pretty good. It's just after Clinton. I mean, you know, America was in a fairly good position, and then the cowboy rode into town, gave tax cuts to the rich, and took two wars out on a credit card. Who would have thought that that would cause havoc? So and that kind of never we never really recovered from that. 
Well, at least we're living overseas for the time being anyway, so we'll just kind of... Yes, it's true. My one-year anniversary was yesterday. I know. Congratulations. Yeah, mine was like a week ago. Oh, really? Oh, my God. That's so crazy. So you left like right when I left. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I remember us talking about that. so insane. Yeah, I mean, I was here for a year first, and then I went back. Oh, okay. I came to Japan for my second time, and you went to the Kingdom of the Netherlands for your first time, and we were about a week apart or so. Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah. It's so funny. Oh, Just God. two kindred spirits, you and me. I know. <laughs> and and, so, maybe, and maybe a third spirit hanging around over you. But... <laughs> you always know. You know uh, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is there anything else, any other hot topic issues you want to hit before we call it, before we uh, wrap it up? I think this was good. I think it was awesome. You know, I think we touched on some topics that are thought provoking. So Yeah, I think so. I'd, I'd heard the arguments about felons and voting rights and stuff several times, and I'd always wanted to talk about that. So I was glad I could ask you your opinion. All right, so you can find me on Twitter, at ReasonBound. And Kai, is there anywhere that you would like to direct people if they'd like to hit you up? Do you have a Twitter in the first place? I don't have a Twitter. I don't have a Twitter. I think I'll set a Twitter account up or something. You should. You should start one up. Okay. You've uh, inspired me. Okay, good. Yeah, just, well, you know how to find me on there. So what about, do you have an email or anything you want to send people to? At a... Kai, nineteen eighty six period km at gmail dot com. I know it's a mouth, it's a mouthful, but let me uh break it down for you. It's K A I I I nineteen eighty six period K as in Kai M as in Mickey at gmail dot com. All right, sounds good. Well, as always, it's a pleasure to speak with you on the podcast. And uh, yeah, you have a nice time there in the kingdom of the Netherlands, and I'll keep rocking Tokyo. And... <laughs> you too. You too, right? All right, sounds good. Talk to you later. Okay, bye.